2020-06, officially establishing the Governor's Office for Emergency Relief and Recovery, uh, also known as GOFER, uh, and we codifying, codifying the processes and procedures for the allocation of expenditure of COVID-19 emergency funds. Executive Director Jerry Little uh, led the first preliminary meeting of that group along with the Legislative Advisory Board uh, yesterday, a very successful meeting. Uh, so the group is already underway. I think they're going to be meeting again tomorrow uh, to make sure that uh, we're prepared when the funds become available, when the guidance documents have been received by the state, we'll be prepared to put some, some of the first dollars out and get the relief and recovery that people need and have come to expect. Uh, it's been a busy past few days with state officials working all over the Easter weekend to secure, as a lot of folks heard, uh, over 91,000 pounds, about 45 tons of life-saving critical personal protective equipment uh, for our frontline workers. And we just want to thank the entire team uh, working around the clock, not just securing it this weekend, uh, but the very rapid pace uh, that it took to actually secure, uh, secure what has become a pretty unprecedented amount of PPE for the state of New Hampshire. Um, without a doubt, it'll be uh, hugely effective uh, in going to our frontline workers and that's a lot of what we're talking about today a huge opportunity in three different phases for our frontline workers the first being the PPE the se second being uh, a financial enhancement for a lot of our frontline workers and the third being some additional testing that we're going to bring online we'll go over those details in, in a little bit but first I want to invite dr. Chan to come up and give us a brief public health update Sir. great thank you and good afternoon um, let me also say thank you to all those involved uh, in acquiring the supplies of personal protective equipment or PPE that we received over the weekend. I just want to make brief mention that uh, PPE is critical in many steps um, of responding to this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, both from caring for patients in the hospital to being able to implement uh, increased testing. Uh, to protecting our health care providers and helping to prevent transmission uh, in facilities between providers and patients. It all starts with having the appropriate personal protective equipment. And so this is a critical step, I think, in responding and continuing our response to COVID-19, but also preparing for the backside of the curve uh, when we start to see uh, decreasing case counts and being able to respond more effectively um, to uh, clusters of infections. Let me um, give you some brief uh, numbers. Uh, we have tested uh, 11,847 uh, people in New Hampshire to date. Currently, there are 73 um, people undergoing testing for COVID-19 at our public health laboratories. Out of those tests, we have identified 1,091 people with confirmed COVID-19 in New Hampshire. That's an increase of 73 individuals reported yesterday. I want to um, pause and make brief mention that uh, we are going to see these numbers fluctuate up and down. Um, part of the reason for the higher numbers today is that uh, I think approximately 30 of these individuals were reported to us from another state's uh, public health laboratory. The uh, Massachusetts Public Health Laboratory has been um, sending us um, some batched testing uh, in, in, in batches, and so we are working with them to have more routine reporting so that we can have uh, a more steady trend in numbers uh, going forward. Uh, and, and so this is a, one situation where um, our different state public health departments are working very closely together to make sure that we have um, the most timely and actionable information. Out of these uh, 1,091 uh, people tested uh, with COVID-19, uh, there were are 163 or about 15% who have required hospitalization at some point during their illness. Uh, and unfortunately and sadly, there are an additional four individuals who have died from COVID-19 that we will be announcing later today. Um, all four of these individuals were older adults that were connected with long-term care facility outbreaks, which is exactly the population that is at increased risk for COVID-19. So our thoughts and sympathies uh, go to the families that are having to deal with this unfortunate um, situation, especially given, given the overall trying times that we are going through with pandemic COVID-19. So in total, we have 27 individuals who have died from COVID-19. All of these individuals are either older adults or individuals with um, multiple chronic medical conditions. And again, this is exactly the group that we want to protect from COVID-19. So while our overall numbers of COVID-19 continue to increase, um, as I mentioned last week, there is evidence that our social distancing efforts um, are having an effect. Uh, we released a new weekly EPI report or a data report yesterday 
I would encourage people to go online and look at that. That's something that we are going to release on a weekly basis. Uh, there's a lot of data in that that many people have been asking for in terms of age breakdowns, um, risk factors, and part of that report is our um, what we call epidemic curve. That epidemic curve uh, looks at the number of people diagnosed with COVID-19 by day. This is uh, the same graph that I showed at the presentation last week on Thursday. And this epidemic curve has shown that the daily um, number of cases has started to plateau. Uh, additionally, we have been looking at data from the New Hampshire Hospital Association that has been collecting data from hospitals throughout the state. Let me thank them for providing and collecting this data. Um, the daily number of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 has stabilized the last week. Um, the last seven or eight days, there have been on average about 70 patients per day hospitalized throughout the state, and this has been a stable number. Uh, what does this mean? This means that the number of new patients being admitted with COVID-19 uh, has equilibrated or has been about equal with the number of new patients that are um, with COVID-19 that are being discharged. This is an indication, I think, that our healthcare facilities um, are not seeing a massive surge or exponential increase in the number of people requiring hospitalization, and this is good news. Um, but likely we will continue to see a fluctuation in these numbers. And so while the actions that we have taken in New Hampshire um, appear to be having an effect, I think that's the encouraging news. Um, now is still the critical time for everybody to continue to take steps to protect one another. Uh, especially those who are most vulnerable in our communities. So it's important for everybody to continue to stay home as much as possible and to only go out for essentials, for example, groceries or medications. Uh, if people do go out, it's important to, take a, to keep a safe distance of at least six feet um, from other people at all times and practice good hand cleaning and good hand hygiene. We do uh, encourage and recommend that people when they're out in public, especially in situations where it may be difficult to keep social distance, uh, that they wear a cloth face mask or a cloth face covering in order to prevent um, transmission of respiratory secretions to other people that may or may not contain the virus that causes COVID-19. And it's important, especially when people are wearing a cloth face covering or a cloth face mask, uh, to avoid touching um, one's eyes, nose, or mouth with unwashed or unclean hands uh, to avoid transmitting the virus either to oneself or to other people. So let me say again, um, as I said last week, thank you to everybody who is uh, who are taking steps to um, prevent the spread of this novel coronavirus. Please continue with those social distancing efforts. We will continue to follow the numbers very closely, uh, but we are still many weeks away of, um, we still have many weeks um, dealing with this virus as the pandemic is likely to continue uh, for weeks, if not months, and we will continue to keep you updated. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chan. The uh, team at Public Health continues to do a great job uh, for the state of New Hampshire. They really do. Um, we started off uh, this, this afternoon by talking about and, and reminding the, the great success story of bringing in 6.6 .6 million pieces of PPE, um, masks, gloves, um, uh, a lot of different opportunities, especially for our frontline workers. We hear often of making sure, people wanting us to make sure that those that are in long-term care facilities or um, that are using uh, services, whether it's in the DD community or other Medi Medicaid service providers, uh, have the protection they need. And that's uh, where a lot of this opportunity is going to go. The second piece of that puzzle uh, really uh, revolves around making sure that those workers uh, are going to be there from a financial standpoint and that we're supporting them from a financial st standpoint. Today I'm announcing the formation of the Long-Term Care Stabilization Program, which will provide a $300 weekly stipend for frontline workers at New Hampshire Medicaid-funded residential facilities and social service organizations, many of whom are struggling to retain the workforce they need to meet the demands associated with COVID-19. The program will directly benefit frontline Medicaid workers that provide long-term care facilities in facility-based settings, as well as in the home and in the community. This program ensures that the critical staff that support some of New Hampshire's most vulnerable individuals, those with physical disabilities, developmental disabilities, and older adults get uninterrupted care during the COVID-19 emergency. New Hampshire must strengthen its commitment to, these, to this workforce during the, the emergency, and the additional stipend recognizes the crucial role that these workers play in our overall public health. 
In short term, the New Hampshire Department of Employment Security will use general funds, which we're confident can eventually be backfilled with federal relief funds, to provide stipends to the employees of participating Medicaid providers until the state can receive a longer term waiver from CMS, uh, the federal government. Qualifying organizations can file an application through an online portal that will go live as soon as tomorrow. To participate, all organizations must agree to pass 100% of all the stipend payments to their frontline workers. Employees of these organizations that are currently working remotely should continue to do so. This program is designed for those individuals on the front lines who are entering these facilities every day to care for our most vulnerable citizens. We're taking action now through employment security so we don't have to wait for the federal government to act. Uh, this is a very innovative program. As far as we can tell, we're the only state in the country to be providing this uh, local bridge, if you will, with our general funds uh, that we'll, uh, we believe can be backfilled again by the federal government uh, with what we call the CMS waiver down the road. Um, the third part of, of really making sure that workers have the, many of the protections that they need, it isn't just PPE and it isn't just being sure that we're paying the frontline workers um, what, what they, they need to be paid to, to care for our loved ones, but it's also uh, testing. Um, our workers on the front lines of long-term care facilities, from nurses who take care of residents to the janitors who ensure that the facilities are sanitized and clean, uh, they all play an important role in, in the fight against COVID. And in a further effort to protect those workers, We'll, we'll be partnering with Convenient MD, uh, who has facilities all over the state, to expand long-term care facility testing in Hillsborough and Rockingham County, which have a combined 6,600, 6,600 healthcare workers, and we're going to make testing available to all those who work in all of those facilities throughout Rockingham and Hillsborough County. That Rockingham and Hillsborough currently account for approximately 70% uh, of the total positive cases in New Hampshire. Um, Convenient MD will conduct mobile testing at sites uh, near all the long-term facilities in Hillsborough and Rockingham, establish two clinical teams of six members each to conduct testing, testing throughout the day uh, until all 6,600 are accounted for. The state will bear the cost of this effort. There'll be no burden on facilities or staff. Um, as we've long said, this is a true team effort and making sure that we're not just attacking one area or another, um, really looking at all the different puzzle pieces that come into play, especially for our frontline workers, is absolutely critical. Uh, the last thing I want to mention today is uh, regional partnerships uh, and working with uh, other states. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that over the past day or so. So I spoke with Governor Phil Scott of Vermont, Janet Mills of Maine, and Charlie Baker of Massachusetts uh, in the past 24 hours. Uh, we've always said that what happens here uh, really has a regional impact. And, and what happens in those other states has an impact on our citizens in New Hampshire, given our workforce connectivity, our communities, our families, our neighbors. Um, there's all a lot of connectivity across our borders, and we have to be very appreciative of that. And so, again, working with them, not that we're going to stay in necessary lockstep. We have to make the right decisions for our state, specifically here in New Hampshire, but understanding where they are when we talk about reopening um, possibly the economy, reopening different aspects that we've had to make the very difficult decisions uh, to shut down, uh, whether it be uh, businesses, uh, whether it be the stay-at-home order, whether it be remote schooling, uh, whether it be uh, what happens on our beaches or our parks or whatever it might be. Uh, we all want to have an understanding of where we are and all the governors have been working very, very well together, very, very closely. Some of the best ideas that we get is just bouncing those ideas off with other governors. I was on a phone call with about 25 other governors last night um, and it was, it was incredibly creative. That's where a lot of the operations are happening across the country and dealing with this crisis um, and uh, all 50 governors I think have come together as a great team to share some of those ideas all with the with the um, incentive of creating opportunity uh, for our citizens specifically here in the great state of New Hampshire um, so we'll keep folks posted as, as we move forward and as we get closer we are still in this for the long haul we are not coming out of this in the next couple weeks we hope maybe this summer and in, in, in the next couple months um, but that's just the reality I, you know one thing I, my job my unfortunate job is to uh, plan for the worst and hope for the best um, that's the responsibility that we have but we are going to start the, that planning now we're going to start seeing how things could possibly open up so when that opportunity arises we're going to be ready we can react quickly and uh, and provide the best services and opportunity for the citizens of our great state uh, with that, we can open up for some questions here before we take some on the phone.
Yes, sir. Uh, you're not going to join the regional compact that has New York and Rhode Island and all these other states. Uh, Andy Cuomo did not did not did not give us a call. Look, New York is New York. It's a, it's a very a very different situation there, and and they're going to have to make a lot of decisions. Uh, Boston is also an acceleratingly uh, difficult situation, um, and and Charlie Baker's I think doing a very good job managing that. But their numbers continue to increase, um, so we're we're a bit different. We we have to be cognizant of our regional partners and what they're doing and where they're going. But um, no, there's not like a you know, a regional pact, so to say, we all have to do exactly the same thing. I, that wouldn't necessarily be right by the citizens of New Hampshire, but we'll continue to work together and share ideas and, and understand their timing, because it, it could have a, an impact on us, to be sure. As far as the $300 stipend goes, um, will that also be allowed for first responders, police, firefighters, or is there, an, are you looking at that as another entity to maybe pay? Yeah, right money? now that would be a different, so the, the question revolves around the $300 and how it would uh, pertain to uh, first responders and um, and, and that uh, sector. Uh, right now this is just pertaining to the frontline workers uh, within the long-term care, Medicaid-driven long-term care and residential uh, service providers. Um, it, that's the opportunity that we have with the federal government to hopefully allow this waiver to come through. Um, most states have, a lot of states have applied for the waiver, um, but we're not going to wait for that. Um, our, our kind of um, uh, secret sauce is that we're going to be able, we, because we've, uh, the state is in decent financial condition today, we have the ability to bridge the gap, provide the opportunity as early as tomorrow, and a lot of these providers, again, can go on the, un, the Employment Security website tomorrow, apply for these funds. And the other beauty here is that these funds 100% go to the frontline workers. 100% have to go to those frontline workers, and that will be audited and, and, and assured. So um, while the organizations themselves apply for the funds, they absolutely have to th flow through the front line, and we have auditing and insurances uh, in place for that. Very unique. Well, so it, it, is this $300 a week uh, going to incentivize more people to, to work, or is it a recognition that they're working in a hazardous situation, a little bit of both? I mean, Yeah, we, we're, what we're really trying to do is stem the outflow. A lot of workers are, are realizing that um, because unemployment is, is very, it, there's a lot of opportunity with unemployment right now and the hazard that they're really in in, in that situation, um, that they're making that choice to, to not be there. Uh, and we need those workers there. Those are critical facilities for, for our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, and so this um, a stipend, if you will, the short-term stipend is being put into place to kind of mirror what we need to do uh, to get through the, you know, the time period of the crisis. Uh, the, what we're going to do is, is sign the executive action to go through the end of June right now, and then we'll kind of take it month to month or a couple months at a time, however we see fit. But again, the things will look, I think, very differently in June. Uh, we, we hope to have the federal uh, match, and, and not, I'm sorry, it's not a match, but the federal, um, it's not a supplanting of funds, but the federal opportunity to come in and essentially uh, take over uh, the expenditures of this program by then. Assuming this funding comes under the, the emergency powers that you have, that's in dispute, obviously, in the courts right now. Yeah. Is there a chance that this stipend could get halted in any way so, by the yeah. judge's decision? So this financial opportunity, it's approximately $30 million a month to our frontline workers. It's all being done through the emergency powers, through my state of emergency. Um, with the dispute that's being um, challenged by the, the Democrats in the legislature, this would all get halted. Absolutely. That's the, one of the tragedies. All, everything we've done, the hospital funding program, right? The potentially the un un expanded unemployment insurance benefits, what we've done for um, domestic violence or child abuse issues. All of these expenditures would likely get halted until, uh, if, if that were to happen. We don't think that's going to happen, but that's one of the downsides uh, of, of, what's, of what is potentially out there. We'll, we'll manage through one way or the other, but that's, um, that would be a very, very tough situation to handle. So your reading of, of the, your legal reading on, on their uh, request for an injunction is that it would, it would extend back before they, they asked for the injunction? Because well, you could read it saying for, for the remainder well, yes, yeah, so if the hospital fund, for example, we've put some money out. If the money's gone out, it's gone out. But all those opportunities going forward, they, they didn't stop. I and mean, we have hundreds of, of organizations looking for financial assistance and help. That would all have to stop. Their complaint is prospective, they say, but you, you're worried that the judge could just knock it all out. They well, again, if any money has gone out, it's gone out. We're not going to claw that back. I don't, I don't think. I would hope a judge wouldn't ask for that. Uh, again, we don't anticipate this happening because, you know, the, the executive powers uh, to the governor uh, are very clear uh, in, the, in this 2002 statute. They were designed actually explicitly for this situation where the governor has to act very quickly, where the governor has to uh, act responsibly in terms of getting financial assistance out, making executive decisions, not just day by day, but sometimes hour by hour and minute by minute. We've done it, I think, very, very well. We have an incredible team here in New Hampshire. We've done it very, very well. And the benefits 
are very clear. I mean, look what happened with the PPE this, this past weekend. It is like the Wild West. You have every government, every agency in this world competing for PPE with a limited number of manufacturers. And you literally have people waiting outside factory doors with suitcases of cash. We've seen photos of it. It's unbelievable, right? And if you don't take a deal when it is offered, you go to the back of the line. That deal doesn't happen. So when Dean came and does his magic, and he did an incredible job, when FedEx you know, says, look, we weren't expecting to do this. We can pull a plane for you. The cost is here. Governor, the cost is here, $4.6 million. Are you in or are you out? If I were to say, well, I'll get back to you tomorrow after the legislature meets, that deal's gone before I've hung up the phone. And we'll miss all that opportunity. And that plane doesn't land this weekend, and we don't have PPE for our frontline workers. That's the absolute reality of what would happen if this injunction that they're trying to, to go forward with were to put, be put into place. That puts people's lives at risk. That puts all these funding mechanisms at risk. The ability to provide funding for L Lakes Region General Hospital, which was this close to bankruptcy, we got the funding in, and now they can actually keep their doors open, right? That's a huge benefit to those individuals in, in that region. All that stops until I have to pick up the phone and get them to meet and do their thing. There is a great place for the fiscal committee in the legislature. It's one of the most powerful bodies, not just here in New Hampshire, but across the country. And there's a great opportunity there and a place for that. In the middle of a worldwide pandemic where minutes matter, the governor needs to have, have the ability to make very, very critical decisions. And I, I'm very proud to say that our entire team has advised through that and been able to, to do that very well for the state of New Hampshire. And in doing so, we've now created this gopher, right, our governor, the Office for Relief and Recovery, where we're now having a legislative, uh, legislative advisory group work side by side with us and able to work as fast as we do now. Right? They're meeting completely transparently and open in public meetings. They can advise, give us advice on, on where the money should be spent, how it should be done. They're walking with us every step of the way. That's a very innovative way to get the legislature to be able to move as fast as I can. Right? No, no one else is doing that across the country. I chose to do that. So we've created models and a pathway for them to have the advice that we need and that stakeholder input that we need. But if this injunction, this lawsuit of theirs goes through, I, it all stops. It all stops and everything slows down. And we can't release funds quickly. We can't get people the, the help they need. We can't help businesses. We can't make deals on a split second for testing materials or PPE or whatever that we might need. Because we've been able to do that to date, we've been incredibly successful. Not just in terms of getting materials and supplies, but look at the viral spread. We're essentially a suburb of Boston. And we've been able to mitigate the viral spread better than, than most states. That's, that's a testament to the people of this state who have taken that responsibility on very seriously, but it's also a testament to our ability to react quickly, to make tough decisions, and they're all tough. They are brutal decisions that we have to make. And it, there's probably a reason why I haven't really slept in the past month, but we're doing really good stuff, and we're doing it quickly, and we're doing right by the people in New Hampshire. That's my only focus right now. I have to get the people in New Hampshire the help, the services that they need and they deserve, and we've done pretty well. To, hand, to put the handcuffs on this office to, from, to be able to do that, that just doesn't make much sense. I'll abide by whatever, if a court decides differently, I'll abide by whatever, the, if they decide that law that was passed wasn't constitutional back in 2002, fine, I'll abide by whatever. You know, I'm a big believer in the rules, but make no mistake, it will drastically inhibit the ability of this state to move forward the way we have. Maybe, uh, maybe a post-mortem will tell this better, but what's, why do you think New Hampshire's got one-fifth the population of Massachusetts, but Massachusetts has 25 times more positive cases? Yeah. Why does Massachusetts well, density, have yeah. 32 times more death? Yeah. I, I, should probably, I, I should probably let Dr. Chan ask. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I play one on TV. Um, but the reality is they do, density plays such a crucial role. You know, if you look at the Washington model that a lot of people talk about, I'm not a big believer in that model um, myself. It uh, is um, much too optimistic for rural states and it's much too pessimistic for states with high popula population densities. It really, I don't know the algorithm exactly, but it really takes density into account. So when you have a, a large area like Boston, uh, where, this, where it can just go like, like wildfire. If you have an apartment building, you have people sharing elevators every single day. You have people in you know, close confined coffee shops even tighter than we have here. Um, you know, just the everyday living and, and, and workplace environments that you have in a place like, like Boston just are, are, are very dangerous and not conducive uh, to being able to mitigate the spread. We're more rural. But remember, we also took, they took some pretty decisive action, but so did we. And if you look at the actions we took relative to the numbers that we had at the time, we were uh, a little more aggressive than most other states in terms of uh, the stay-at-home order, the decision to go to remote learning, 
the decision to close, uh, you know, go to takeout at restaurants, um, and the decision to go to uh, to only have essential businesses open. So we were pretty aggressive in our approach as well. But um, I think Charlie Baker and, and, and what they're doing down there, God bless them. I think they're doing as, as well as they can. They're trying to manage as, as well as they possibly can. Um, but that is a factor. They are only 20 to 30 miles south of us. We've had some success here, but let's not take it for granted. We could get a second surge, a second spike, uh, whatever you might call it, at, at any point in time, and we have to be prepared for that. In terms of the incoming to our newsroom for the public, uh, there's a lot of anxiety from people about when we might see more expanded testing. You know, clearly, sure. it's going to happen in the long-term care facilities in the southern tier. Is there a plan to maybe grow that and get sure. more people tested as time goes on? Sure. So we're going to be testing a lot of folks using uh, the MIT, I believe it's called the Broad Lab, uh, down at MIT, uh, which is a, a huge opportunity. We'll be able to um, send a lot of the tests out there for this initial phase where we work with the long-term care facilities. We have more tests, we believe, coming in for the APID the Abbott rapid testing devices, which uh, as a lot of folks know, I was pretty frustrated only getting a hundred cartridges or so uh, last week, but we have a few hundred more we think that are gonna be coming in in short order. We've already shipped one of those devices up to Berlin. Uh, we'll have other devices hopefully up and running uh, shortly. Um, the ability for us to use other outside labs, the ability to um, pot potentially expand uh, testing, whether it's at Dartmouth or our public lab is always there. Uh, more labs and more testing opportunities always coming online. So it'll continue to grow as we go forward. And uh, again, after we use the the, the convenient MD and Broad Labs for the long-term care facilities in Rockingham and, and Hillsboro. Uh, there'll be opportunity to, to keep expanding that. Um, Dr. Tan, do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the testing opportunity, the, any of the new guidance? Am I putting you on the spot? Uh, I'm going to put you on, I'm sure. going to put Dr. Chan on the spot. He can always handle it. So. Uh, I, I might also turf things to the commissioner as well to talk a little bit more about um, convenient um, MD. But, you know, our, our goal has always been to be able to increase testing for those, um, especially those who are more vulnerable to complications and where the test may help um, inform care or medical care. For example, if someone subsequently needs to go into the hospital, having a positive um, test can be, can be very helpful and, and beneficial. Um, <clears throat> I, I think there's, there's several different phases to testing, if you will, right? I mean, we're, we're well past the point where we are going to be able to contain this virus. Um, and we're not in a position to be able to test everybody that might have symptoms of COVID-19. Um, and so there are still patients where um, it, it may be appropriate for a healthcare provider if they're not at high risk of complications and they're having mild symptoms to be told to stay home for at least seven days from the onset of their symptoms. Um, plus, you know, ensuring that they're home for at least 72 hours um, after uh, there, any fever resolves and after symptoms start improving, right? So there's a time frame that someone, whether they have suspect or confirmed COVID-19, should remain home for to prevent spreading the virus um, to, to other people. Um, and so someone can have symptoms, have suspect COVID-19 and be told to do that, um, or someone can have symptoms, have suspect COVID-19 go in for testing and still be told to do that, right? So, so testing doesn't always inform, um, isn't always necessary to, to take the appropriate action to, to stay home. But what we want is to be able to increase testing for those where um, uh, if they're diagnosed with COVID-19, a positive test can inform, can inform care. Um, we've highlighted some of those populations already. Um, people that are uh, of an older age, people with chronic medical conditions, people that uh, work or support community services, people in jails or prisons, for example. These are um, additional groups that we would like to be able to see um, increased testing for. And so we're going to be putting out um, a health alert network message later, uh, hopefully this afternoon or evening, that um, highlights some of our updated testing guidance for uh, people and groups of people that we think should be tested. But, but the reality is that the, the decision on whether or not to test a patient um, is in the hands of a provider, right? So if a person has symptoms, has concerns for COVID-19, their first stop should be a call to their healthcare provider to talk about those symptoms, what, what risk factors they may have, um, and, and whether testing may or may not be appropriate. I think the barriers that a lot of clinicians are finding in the community, even if they want to test a patient, is where do they send someone? Um, and so there's a couple answers for that. The CDC has put out some um, new guidance in the last week or so that makes it easier for healthcare providers, primary care providers to test um, with um, PPE conserving methods. Um, but I think one of our goals has been to also make testing uh, sampling 
resources more available in communities. And so you, you heard the, the governor um, talk about um, uh, some work that is some partnership that we have with Convenient MD. We're going to be talking more about um, trying to increase uh, access to, to sampling specimen collection capacity in the community through um, our work with Convenient MD and, and other partners like the Manchester and Nashua Departments of Health. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, we, are, we want to test to the ability that we have the supplies available. That's the per, you know includes personal protective equipment. That includes the swabs and the and the specimen collection supplies, um, and so we will work with our community partners to try and get the, make that happen. Um, this is particularly important for um, if and when we start to see a decrease in the number of cases in New Hampshire once we're on the backside of that curve, is that we need to be able to have uh, increased testing capabilities so that once we manage to suppress the outbreak, we can um, be flexible and nimble to respond to new outbreaks or new clusters, whether it's at a long-term care facility or at, at a, at a, in a community location. We need to be able to have increased testing capability, not only because it helps impact patient care and, and the health of patients, but also because it helps, uh, it can help to inform our ability to control and suppress this virus, um, including, um, you know, potential future outbreaks or waves of infection um, if and when we're, it's not, it's not an if, it's when we're able to, you know, bring this outbreak under control. So what, is, what is the protocol that's envisioned for the testing of the long-term care home service providers? I'm going to let the commissioner speak to that. So we contracted with Convenient MD. Uh, they are going to partner with all long-term care facilities, um, which includes assisted living facilities in Rockingham, Hillsborough County. We'll be asking the administration in those buildings to provide a list to Convenient MD of all their employees. Um, they will set up mobile sites either um, in the parking lot or close vicinity to two or three facilities. They will be there to capture all three shifts of employees. Employees will um, show up with uh, an ID, like a facility ID, um, to show that they work for the facility and do the appropriate testing. We have the option of, uh, for this contract specifically, um, as, as the governor said, uh, going to an MIT lab or using commercial labs, and we're still evaluating on who's going to have a better turnover and what which one's the most cost effective. I think what we have found um, in it, over the last several weeks and as we learn more about this virus is that uh, we've found that the the impact on the long-term care resident is significant the amount of negative outcomes is uh, dramatic in the long-term care uh, facilities so we want to make sure that that is our priority when it comes to testing and um, what testing does is allows the facility to cohort their, their residents appropriately. So in the two outbreaks that we've had, we went through um, with our MMRS team, our, our mobile team at the state, and we tested all of the residents in that facility to identify asymptomatic carriers so that we could cohort appropriately. Then they went through and they tested the employees, and we, we were able to do the same thing. Because of some of those results, we found it very beneficial to um, to look at those facilities and say, how can we identify the ones that we don't know about? So essentially, this allows us to get about 6,600 additional people tested that are on the front lines of our caring for the most vulnerable people in our state. So how often is the average worker going to be tested? So right now, we're going to start off with, with one round, right? We're going to uh, set up over the next 20 days is, is the goal. Um, that we're going to set up mobile sites to get everybody tested. And let's see what happens. If we test 6,600 asymptomatic people and they're all negative, then the, we, we really need to evaluate, is this a value to, to our testing capacity, to, to our testing strategy? If we do those 6,600 people and find out 10 or 15 or 20 percent of them are positive and they're asymptomatic, asymptomatic spreaders, then we are going to expand both the number of times we do that test and the counties in which we're doing the test. But that's not our only testing strategy. Right now, we're sending our mobile team out to different communities for exactly what Dr. Chan said. You have providers that want to get their patients tested and they're not sure. So Convenient MD has been a phenomenal partner. Partner. Um, 
it, and there's a lot of really great partnerships that we've developed in this. Um, one one way to get uh, someone tested is to send them to Convenient MD. But when we have a regular presence in our community through our mobile testing clinics, either the one that we set up or the one the hospital set up, set up that is another option. So we want to make sure that we're testing the people that have the symptoms and the underlying conditions to make sure they can get tested. As far as the four people who died, uh, which which home or homes were they affiliated with? Um, three of them were at the Hanover Hill Healthcare Center, and one of them was at Huntington Place. And those are confirm those are confirmed as of today. That is not um, recent passings, but as we've talked about before, sometimes it takes several days to get the confirmation of death. Just one more for Dr. Chan, if you don't mind. On, um, with each additional day that we see this plateau that you described, does the likelihood of a surge decrease? So the question is, with each additional day of a plateau, does the likelihood of a surge decrease? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, you know, I, I think that really depends on um, our ability to continue uh, with our social distancing measures, right? So I think likely what we're going to see is that it's this is um, – the epidemic in New Hampshire is going to plateau. We're going to see some ups. We're going to see some downs. Our, our hope is that it stays, you know, stable. It doesn't continue to increase, and that at some point um, we we break transmission to the extent where uh, we see a decrease of number of cases and number of hospitalizations um, in our community. Um, but as has been talked about before, um, if we were to relax our social distancing now, we likely would see a, a dramatic increase again in the the number of infections. Maybe not right away, but um, you know the the incubation time of this virus, meaning that the time between when someone is exposed and infected and when they develop symptoms can be up to 14 days and so if uh, people are um, relaxing their social distancing efforts um, you know meeting with one another potentially exposing and spreading the virus between one another you know within within a, a couple of weeks we could see you know an, an increasing number of, of cases so our, our hope is that this remains plateaued so to speak the epidemic curve remains plateaued we're going to see some ups we're going to see some downs at some point we want to see it go down but um, there's always the, uh, the possibility and the potential that we could see an increase, and that's part of the, the need to maintain our social distancing at this time. Governor, there has been a petition started to try and <coughs> urge you to reopen New Hampshire by uh, April 24th. It reads in part, we believe the occasion of this virus does not warrant the suppression of liberty attempted, and that many citizens suffering undue hardship and loss of livelihood, purpose, and community. Um, I know you're a live free guy, 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 so I wanted you to respond to this. And also, you are out in the community a fair amount. Are you, are you running into people with this anxiety? Please reopen this, Governor. What are you, what are you yeah, well, hearing? So re in response to the, there's a petition online, I think that's the question, though, to, to reopen things. And it was the first time we believe... Um, the, 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 the virus does not warrant the suppression of liberty. Look, I believe that public health trumps everything. I do. I believe that my responsibility as governor is to make sure we don't have a massive viral spread that we've seen all across the world, that we've seen in neighbors like New York and Boston that are, are killing people at, at unprecedented rates. Um, I believe this is incredibly serious. We've never seen anything like it. And um, I believe that the decisions, incredibly difficult decisions that I've had to make uh, have had a beneficial uh, uh, effect. And exactly to Dr. Chan uh, and the experts uh, that are out there that have been very clear that if we do maintain the physical distancing, if we do maintain our discipline um, for at least in the short and, and possibly into the long term, uh, ultimately we have a lot of faith and hope that we'll start actually seeing a decrease. But the fact is we had 70 plus new cases reported today. 70 new cases today. Four deaths, okay? These are real numbers. This is one of the worst days we've had. We've seemed to hit this plateau, and that's a very good thing, but we are by no means on a downslide here. And if that downside does come, it's probably going to be of a long, slow tail, as we've discussed, as opposed to some quick drop-off down to zero. There's no vaccine in the near future. Um, it could come as early as next spring or next summer. We hear rumors like that, but we really don't know. Um, there's no, right now, there's no available um, a cocktail, if you will, of, of pharmaceuticals to suppress some of the more severe symptoms uh, to the point where the mortality rate is, 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 is lowered. Um, uh, and we see the mortality rate being uh, extremely serious, especially in the vulnerable um, uh, age, age groups of, you know, elderly, 60 and up, 80 and up. Um, it's, it's very serious. And no one takes the live for your die motto more true to heart than I do. 
I live and breathe by it. But as governor, you have to make tough decisions and you have to put public health first. Do we have time for some uh, on, the, on the phone questions? Sure. <clears throat> Holly Raymer with the Associated Press. Holly, please go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, it was a little hard to hear uh, when the commissioner was um, asked about the four deaths at long-term care facilities. I thought I heard three at Hanover Hill, but I couldn't hear the fourth. And oh, then one at Hun the Huntington. Question, Sorry. Do you know roughly how many workers um, across the state would be eligible for this $300 a week statement? Um, so uh, just to answer your first question, the, uh, the unfortunate passings that were confirmed by COVID were three at Hanover and one at Huntington. Is that right? And I believe Huntington's in Nashua. Yeah. Is that correct? Um, if you, hopefully you heard that, Holly. Uh, the second question is we estimate between 20, uh, somewhere between 20 and 25,000, up to 20 or 25,000 uh, individuals, frontline long-term care workers and uh, service providers in the communities would be eligible for the $300 a week stipend um, that, again, they can, uh, providers can start applying for as early as tomorrow. Great. Thank you, Holly. The next question is from Mia Summerson with the Keen Sentinel. Okay. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, after the order went into effect that limited operations at lodging facilities, there have been some reports of some of the uh, our local communities more vulnerable citizens, such as homeless uh, individuals, who have been unable to find places to safely self-isolate or quarantine if they're symptomatic. Is the state working on anything to make accommodations available for those people? Absolutely. So the question revolves around the accommodations that might revolve around uh, homeless individuals that may have require a quarantining uh, or that may be COVID positive. We have uh, facilities in place and ready to go. So um, in all seriousness, we'll, we'll make sure we have somebody reach out if there are individuals in, that, in that, those communities who are in those situations. We have a place for them uh, and we can provide services and take care. Absolutely. And the next question comes from Michael Graham with InsideSources.com. Michael, please go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, one for Dr. Chen, one for the governor. Dr. Chen, what percentage of the people who've been hospitalized here in New Hampshire are 60 or over? And Governor, uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, one of the executive councilors who happens to be running for governor himself referred to you as the king. You've been accused by another person running for governor of starting a slush fund by not having fiscal council involved. And the National Democratic Governors Association is running an ad with the phrase Sununu flu attempting to connect you apparently to the coronavirus. What's your response to this uh, politics? Is this what we're supposed to see in a thriving democracy, even at a time of a pandemic? <laughs> I got to be honest, I couldn't keep up with a lot of those questions. Um, uh, look, I, when it comes to people that want to take political shots or whatever it is, for some reason, the past couple of days, there's uh, the, I guess folks are coming out of the woodworks. Um, I don't care. I got to be very blunt about it. There's not a single decision we've made in this state that is an incredibly difficult. And there's not a single decision that has been made with politics in mind. If other people want to do that, frankly, shame on them. Uh, we don't have any time for that. We're, we're just focused on getting relief out quickly, getting it out fast. I think we've handled the, the ability and the responsibility of the state's emergency order um, with openness, with transparency. We're out here every day. We're explaining exactly what we're doing. Nothing is done behind scenes. Nothing is done behind closed doors. The public's uh, input is very important, and we've, we've heeded a lot of that input. The legislature's input is very important. We've heeded that. We've created a process for the legislature <clears throat> to work with us side by side at the speed that we need to work. Not that we want to work, that we absolutely need to work to get these vital services and funds out uh, as quickly as possible. And what we've been able to do has been ter tremendous. Um, the, the example that we're setting, not just here in New Hampshire, for, but for other states, I'm incredibly proud, and we have a great team behind us. Um, so if people want to take shots at me, go right ahead. Um, I, I can take it. I got big shoulders. But at the end of the day, we have a mission to do, uh, to, to accomplish. We're, we're way far away from the end of that road, frankly. And we're just going to put our heads down and get the job done as best we can. If other po folks want to play politics, so be it. Um, I think the second, the more important question, frankly, had to do with the demographics uh, a little yeah. bit on the... And and I'll make the uh, the question was what percentage of those who are hospitalized are 60 and, and older? And I unfortunately don't don't have those numbers. We can look into it and, and get back to you. But um, I I don't know those numbers right now. Thanks. And the final question comes from Rick Jurgens with Valley News. Rick, please go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, I also have a numbers question. Uh, if I doing the math right, so 15 of the 27 deaths in, the, in, the, in New Hampshire so far, 
have been uh, residents of nursing homes or assisted living or other group group facilities. And my question is, um, can the state, does the state intend to include in its regular disclosures the uh, numbers of cases and deaths occurring among either residents uh, or staff uh, at these uh, group uh, homes, uh, the nursing homes and other types of group, group homes? I'm going to let the uh, commissioner answer that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So we have, uh, we do public disclosures when we have uh, reason to believe that the facility is is in um, an active outbreak. So a facility that not only has a certain number of cases, but there is evidence to show uh, widespread transmission between uh, both worker and residents. So, you know, any time that there is a facility that that we feel like really needs to come out and um, talk about what's going on in their in their facility publicly, the first step we do, and we've d we've done this with uh, the facilities we've announced, and we're actually actually actively doing that with a couple of additional facilities right now, is to communicate with their families and their residents um, about some of the COVID positive. Uh, uh, clusters they've had in their facility um, so I'm there are several facilities that may have one person and after uh, several days of watching or a week of watching we see that it doesn't go beyond that one person uh, so there's we don't feel there's any reason to come out and talk about that publicly any more than any other individual in our in, in any of our communities Bill said? Okay, so we're all set. Anything else uh, for folks in the room? I can, Adam, yeah, I can uh, see. I've got a question. Uh, sure. Dr. Chan, can I help on this one? Uh, we know, generally speaking, that there are probably more fatalities than there are confirmed fatalities. How active are you in investigating the potential that there are individuals out there who passed away from COVID-19 who we don't know about yeah. or didn't have a positive test? I guess just sort of that, that universe of possibilities. Yeah. That's a that's a great question. The question is um, how how actively are we looking into the possibility of other COVID nineteen related deaths, um, for example, outside of a medical system, right? So, so if someone is in a hospital, um, you know they have and somebody unfortunately passes away in a hospital, they they have the ability um, of testing and figuring out what the cause of of death in that individual is. Um, we are aware of um, situations where um, people may pass away at home or they may pass away at a assisted living facility, for example, um, and the cause of death isn't always immediately knowable or, or um, uh, apparent. And so we are actually working with um, our EMS providers um, and the medical examiner's office to try and uh, test those for whom there is um, suspicion of COVID-19, right? I mean, not, not everybody who passes away um, necessarily needs COVID-19 testing, um, but we've been in conversations with the office of the chief medical examiner um, who has jurisdiction over if someone dies um, or passes away and there's, um, it, it, there's an unclear cause or maybe they had symptoms of COVID-19 of trying to get those individuals tested. So that, that's something we're actively looking at um, Trying to trying to work on it and and identify. Thanks. Can I can I expand a little bit on that? Just uh, that brings up a, a really good point. Um, you know, one thing that uh, I've been talking with Dr. Chan about a little bit is um, depend re regardless of how many tests you do. Right? We might do a lot of testing, we might do a little testing. Massachusetts might have a higher rate of testing, or New York might have a higher rate, or, or you know, another state might have a lower rate of testing. Uh, so we know that there's a lot of folks out there that likely have COVID, but yet have to be identified. Uh, one of the great equalizers, if you will, is the hospitalizations. For the most part, if you have symptoms that require a hospitalization, you're going to go. And therefore, you're going to, for lack of a better term, get in the system and, and be identified as someone that has uh, symptomatic um, <clears throat> issues related to COVID. And in the same way, unfortunately, so is the mortality rate. A again, we'll hopefully be able to identify with pretty good accuracy almost all the mortalities in terms of whether they were related to COVID or not. So when you look at how we compare to other states, a lot of people look at the number of actual proven cases. But um, that is all variable depending on how accurate and how often you're testing. 
but the hospitalizations is one number that is fairly consistent amongst populations given that if you have the symptoms and need to be hospitalized, you're going to be. So uh, one way that we compare ourselves to other states is that hospitalization rate or even the mortality rate to see where we are you know, with the surge, what has plateaued, what hasn't. So it's not just, I just wanted to add there, um, it's not just the number of cases, but the hospitalizations. And that's why confirming a, mor a mortality or a hospitalization as being COVID or not COVID is incredibly important. And where I believe one of the more accurate uh, numbers we can look at in terms of determining where we are. The numbers are smaller. That sample size is small. So that's where some of the inaccuracy could come. But for the most part, you can de determine it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's binary a little bit, uh, as opposed to knowing that there's a lot of people that likely have COVID or maybe asymptomatic with COVID out there, but that we just haven't identified for a, a number of reasons. Sorry, I think we have one more on the phone as well. And the next question is from Paula Tracy with In-Depth. Paula, please go ahead with your question. Good afternoon. I... Oh. Hi, Paula. Hi. Oh, hi. How are you? Hi. I guess I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I heard from the delegation to state uh, secured about 15 million for airports in New Hampshire. Um, can you talk to me about um, how important uh, keeping those facilities open are during this uh, and, and what you think about the efforts to try to maintain some funding for this? Airport. Sure. So the question revolves around uh, about $15 million in secured funding by the federal delegation for specifically airports within New Hampshire. I have to be honest, that's the first I'm hearing of it, and that's terrific news. Uh, there was a lot of airport funding in the original CARES Act, but uh, it was all for big airports. It, it really cut uh, Ma Manchester and other smaller airports out of the mix. So uh, securing that federal federal money is very, very important, given that air travel has is, is drastically been reduced. Therefore, the revenues coming in to Manchester Airport and other smaller airports, uh, not just here in New Hampshire, but across the country are taking a real hit to be sure. So securing some of those funds are, are really critical. And uh, Ted Kitchens, the new director, uh, he's new. I say he's new. He's been there about a year now. Um, he does a tremendous job over at Manchester Airport in particular. And I'm sure he'll be, he'll be as thrilled as I am to hear that they secured some funding for him. That's terrific. Great. Well, thank you all very much for joining us again today. You know, today is it was really about making sure we're putting all those puzzle pieces together, especially for our frontline workers, PPE, testing, funding, incentives to ensure that the workforce will be there for our loved ones and our most vulnerable population. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but um, we challenge ourselves. We uh, keep trying to find innovative ways to do it New Hampshire's way, to do it a little different than some of the other states are doing it, and set that kind of gold-plated example for others to follow. So we just can't thank enough for the teams for putting their head together and really coming up with uh, some of these very unique and creative solutions uh, to protect our, our, the workers that are really on the front lines uh, that do it day in and day out. We just cannot thank them enough. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we have to stay disciplined. The stay-at-home order is very much in place. Please only go out of your home if you absolutely need to, whether it's for exercise or, or shopping or, or going to work, uh, grocery stores or whatever it might be. But really, we are healthier at home. It's a very important message that we keep carrying through. Uh, we've seemed to hit a plateau here with our numbers. That's a very good sign. But we are still a long ways away from, uh, from finding our way out. With our discipline uh, and making the sacrifices that we've all been, a, been willing to make, um, it really is making a difference. It's setting ourselves apart uh, from our neighbors uh, in a very positive way. And if we we keep that up, we can get through this and we will get through this together. Thank you all very much.